so like you said, I'm Sam. Uh, I had a web design agency that built websites and did marketing for attorneys. Built that for three years and it was acquired last year. Um, now I have a new company called Offsprout, which is a website building platform for design agencies. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about some lessons that I learned building that agency and going shifting from a freelancer to uh, more of a agency owner. So first, I uh, just want to get a sense of the room. How many people have like a WordPress freelancing business or uh, at least a business on the side doing design? So good amount of you. And of those of you with a WordPress business, how many people have a business with two employees, full-time employees or more? So much less, and that's, it's not something to feel bad about. I was a freelancer for a bunch of years, and it is really, really hard to scale a, a design business, a, a WordPress-based business. And so I kind of want to talk about how we figured out how to, how to scale and grow that. So I want to start with these statistics. Uh, does anyone want to guess what I'm going to point out from these numbers? What if I do this? Nobody? All right. If you do the math, the average business, so there's 226,000 web design employees. There's 156,000 web design businesses. So the vast majority of web design businesses are just businesses with one person. So again, really, really hard to scale a web design business. So, the problem is, like, if you're a solo, solopreneur, you're a freelancer, you're doing a lot of stuff. You're searching for new work, you're writing proposals, that means you have to estimate time and cost, which means you are probably building functionality from scratch a lot of the time, and that means you have to research how to build that functionality, and then, of course, you'll have the old client that comes out of the woodwork and says, hey, can you just make an update to my site real quick? And most of them don't expect to pay you anything. They're just assuming that because you built their site that everything is all included in that upfront fee. And at the end of the day, if you have some time, maybe you can update your own business website and maybe a social life at the end of the week. So basically, when I was a freelancer, I figured out I was doing too much and I had to do less. Anyone? likes forgetting Sarah Marshall. So I, I thought about how can I scale, and there are two things that I realized I needed to do. I needed to minimize the time that I was spending building websites and serving clients, and the word for that is productize, at least in the, the design agency sense. And then I had to maximize my recurring revenue. So I had to kind of get off the revenue roller coaster so I could ha be able to project uh, my revenue further into the future and more accurately so I knew if I could hire. So before I go on, I want to take a quick detour and talk about choosing a niche because choosing a niche is a really important part of being able to scale, in my opinion. So you may be thinking, like, if I choose a niche, I'm probably leaving money on the table. Like, if I have you know, people from various industries coming to me, they're willing to pay me money, why would I say no to some of them? And there are a couple reasons. The first is it's easier to market. So let's say Sally is a restaurant owner who needs a website, and she's contemplating two options. One is a design firm, Joe's design firm. He's a Word, WordPress designer. He's been around for 10 years. He's been building websites for a while. He has a nice portfolio. And he says, you know what? I, I got some nice designs. I've been doing this for a while. I can, I can build you a website. The other option that she's contemplating is a business called uh, Restaurant Rocket. And they build websites specifically for restaurants. And she goes to their website, and there's an article about using social media to promote your special of the week or special drink of the night or whatever. And they have a portfolio full of restaurant websites, and they say, like, uh, you know, they have 
uh, an offering that's just local SEO. So if you have a bunch of locations, they make sure that your meta tags are set up correctly. If Sally's contemplating between these two options, one is going to look much more attractive to her than the other. And that's Restaurant Rocket because they're speaking directly to her. So it's much easier to market if you niche down because you get to speak directly to your customer rather than casting a wide net. And that means it's easier to build trust. Again, if you're speaking directly to your customer, you're, say, you're, you're speaking their language. You're saying, you know, I'm, I'm not talking to lawyers. I'm just talking to restaurants. So if you're a lawyer, you know, you can go somewhere else. I can refer you to someone. But if you're a restaurant, we do that better than anyone else. And we're the last stop that you have to make. So it's easier to build trust, which means it's easier to sell. So selling is basically a, a trust versus price equation. If you build up enough trust, your uh, potential client is willing to pay more. And if your price is within that range that they're willing to pay, you have a sale. Are you taking questions? Uh, I'll take questions at the end unless okay. the convention is to take questions during. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, it, it seems like part of what you're saying is the um, vocabulary of the business versus the, the technology of, of building the site. Uh, so, yeah, so there's a marketing component and then there's also a technological component that I'm about to get into right now that makes it, that I think it, being in a niche makes it easier to, to serve your clients. So that's a good question. So, like I said, the last, the last part of why it's good to choose a niche is it's easier to productize. And now we'll end the detour and go back to what is a productized service since, uh, Tom said that productized doesn't pass the spell check. It's a kind of a new concept. Um, so my definition for it is a productized service is a service with a well-defined, repeatable set of processes that minimizes the skill needed to complete each process. So let's parse that out a little bit. So on a spectrum, you have service businesses, and that's what most freelancers are. And service businesses are great because they're very quick to revenue. You put up a website, a landing page, and that's basically all you need to do in order to start accepting customers. So that's, that's a great part of a service business. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a SaaS business. And it takes a long time to get to launch a SaaS business, um, but they're very scalable. So in between the two of those, you have a productized service. So you have the scalability more like a SaaS, but you have the quick-to-revenue-ness of a service business. And to distinguish between a service and a productized service, the main distinction is that in a service business, the client will dictate the scope. So let's say you have a business and an interior decorator comes to you, they want to build a website. And they say, I, I got this great idea. It's a social media wall, and we're going to draw in posts from Pinterest, and we're going to draw in posts from Twitter and Instagram, and I want all of that in a nice masonry grid on my website. Price that out for me and come up with a proposal. And so you say, okay, that sounds awesome. I'll get you a proposal by end of day tomorrow. And you, you go, and you know the guy said, price it out separately. So you go, you do the proposal, you say, it's going to cost $3,000 to build this social media wall. Bring that back to the potential client, and he says, well, $3,000, that's, that's a bit much. What if we just do Pinterest? And you say, OK, great. I'll get you a proposal by tomorrow. So you go back to the drawing board, you find a plug-in, draws in Pinterest pins, and you say, OK, that's going to cost you $1,000, not $3,000 says, OK, great. And I assume that that can just draw in pins from just these two boards and not my entire Pinterest account. And you say, oh, uh, one second. Let me, let me check. So you go back to the drawing board. It turns out that the plugin that you were going to use doesn't do what he wants you to do. So you're going to have to customize the plugin. You go back to him. It's going to cost $2,000. And he says, you know what? Forget about it. We'll just skip that for now. So you've just gone and done three proposals, three versions of the proposal, and you have zero additional revenue. That's what happens when the client dictates the scope. In a productized service, you dictate the scope. So you say, you know, I build websites for attorneys. 
I know that attorneys are going to need attorney pages. They're going to need practice area pages. They're probably going to need an attorney directory that allows them to filter by position. Uh, they will need some sort of local SEO. They probably want some reporting tools. This is what I offer. If you need that, I'm the place to go. If you need something else, I can refer you to someone. So you dictate the scope. That means that service businesses are much more variable and productized services have very little variation. So once you get that small amount of variation, you're able to break down what it is you do into very component parts, very specific processes, and then you can break out those processes and say, okay, this process uh, requires a lot of skill. Like, you know, this needs a designer, but these, all these processes don't re require that much skill, and I can just outsource these to someone. I can get a freelancer who will do this. Um, I can get a contractor or whatever. I can even get a VA, depending on the level of uh, skill required. So here's, here's one thing that you have to do for clients, right? Build a site. But really, you can break that down into a bunch of component processes. So you send a getting started guide to get the client preferences, you get that back, you record those design preferences in something like Trello where you do your project management, and you create the site, you add all the pages that they need from their site map, you implement the design, you add content, complete revisions, launch site. So if you look at that, and this is simplified a bit, but if you look at that, really only two of those processes require a bunch of skill. Implement the design, that requires a designer, right? And then complete revisions. There are likely to be design revisions, and so, the, again, you're, that re requires a designer. But look at all of these other processes that, you're, that you have to do to build the site that don't really require any skill. You can just document all of these pr procedures in something like Process Street and get very finite and very specific with what it takes to do this and so every time you need a contractor, you just send out this process, and it has all the in instructions, and it's really kind of foolproof at that point. And you can just outsource all of this stuff and do the parts that require a lot of work. And if you remember, there were those two parts that required more skill, but we can actually dive into those two a little bit deeper. So if you try and break up implement design, it could be apply site template, apply page templates, add attorney directory, and customize. So again, if you're niched down, if all of your clients are attorney clients, they basically need the same thing every site. I mean, every client wants to think that they're a unique snowflake, but if you have a web design business, you know that there are a lot of things that you're doing over and over again for each client. And if you have a set of templates and you're just customizing from that set of templates, that's going to get you, you know, pretty much all the way there for a majority of clients. So, again, we separate implement design. We separate complete revision into uh, revising content and also revising the design. And, again, if we look at these, only two of these processes require a bunch of skill, customizing and revising design. Those re require a designer. But all of these other ones don't re require as much skill. So again, you can outsource that. And also, it becomes a lot quicker to do stuff like this because everything is procedurized, everything is documented, everyone knows exactly what they're doing. You can just knock it out really quickly. So how do you design an offering that's so repeatable? And won't there be pressure to expand that offering? Uh, yes, there will be pressure, but if you go into it uh, with one of these three strategies, you can probably uh, keep your offering pretty contained. So uh, the overarching concept here is stay focused. You want to be able to serve your clients as quickly as possible, um, and you want to try and maximize the profit that you can make so that, you know, you or you can hire and expand um, and resist the urge to expand your services too much. So strategy one is the essentials. 
So if you're creating your offering, you can have an essential strategy. That's basically just the site design. So you have a site design, you have the features that your client is going to need. Uh, you don't do any marketing, but you say, okay, you're, you're a client that just needs uh, a site. I'm your guy. I can do that. I can build you a beautiful site. It's not going to cost you as much as some of my competitors because I have all of these efficiencies built into my process. So I'm going to start with this essentials strategy and just try and do volume with the essential strategy. So you're just doing the site design. You forget the rest. Strategy two is you start out with that same small core of the site, but then you add a mandatory premium component. So again, if we go back to Sally, the restaurant owner, maybe you sit, you're the type of business that says, okay, we build you the site, but we also, we know that in order to be a successful restaurant, you're going to have to do some social media marketing. And so if you're going to work with us, we, we do this social media marketing better than anyone else. We'll post to your Twitter several times a week. We'll, you know, we'll have an email marketing list where we blast out your specials on a weekly basis. And that's a mandatory component because we've seen that uh, the clients that are most successful have this. And so we don't even work with clients who aren't serious about you know, building up their online presence anymore. But if you are serious about it, Come to us, and you know we'll we'll do your social media marketing. So mandatory premium component, and you tell the client they can take it or leave it. The last is a combination. So it depends on what your market is. Some markets are big enough that you can have a take it or leave it attitude about a premium component. Others you might want to uh, have separate tiers. So you could have the core tier. And then you could have bundle tiers that bundle those premium components. Um, it's also kind of what your risk tolerance is and how long you want to wait until your business is really into gear because you're going to be turning away a lot of business if you just uh, work with people with the premium component. On the other hand, that is a good way to quickly build up your recurring revenue. And... Um, no matter what uh, strategy you choose, you want to make sure that everything that you're offering is repeatable. So remember how we broke down the process of designing your site? You want to make sure that if you're offering that social media management that you can break down that process into its component parts and document all of those as quickly as possible so you can eliminate the parts that don't really require much skill from your plate, outsource those, give them to a contractor, whatever. Um, the next part that's really important, and I've seen, I, I think this might be the number one mistake. It was certainly my number one mistake as a freelancer, uh, not paying attention to recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is the lifeblood of a scalable web design company. It allows you to forecast your revenue more accurately and further into the future, and it allows you to build revenue month to month so that you're not dependent on lead flow, you're maintaining a client list, and so your revenue can build over time regardless of whether your lead flow builds over time. So to illustrate this, let's uh, take two examples, two different strategies, uh, businesses trying to make $10,000 a month. So business one they sell a website for $2,500, but they don't charge recurring revenue. So in order to make $10,000, they need to sell four websites. Business two, on the other hand, they use a tier strategy. They have 20 clients that are on a $100 a month plan. They have three clients that are on an SEO plan that they charge $1,000 a month for. So they go into the month with $5,000 in recurring revenue, which means they only need to sell two websites for $2,500 each in order to get that same amount of revenue, that $10,000. And that's huge. That means you have to drive half as much traffic to your website, you have to do half as much networking, you have to, do half, you know, you have to close half as many deals in order to make the same amount of revenue. So it's, it's absolutely huge. Can't stress that enough. And if you expand that out over time, you can see 
this is basically the same amount of business. It's just business two is charging recurring. And you can see their revenue uh, goes up over time, whereas business one just oscillates around um, uh, one number depending on what the lead flow looks like that given month. And if you're wondering what you can charge monthly for, there are a bunch of different things. Um, the first is hosting, security, backups, maintenance. So you can have a WP Engine account. They take care of most of that for you. You can stack a bunch of different clients on one account, and you up, up charge for that. But it takes that off your client's plate. Your client really doesn't want to deal with hosting and maintenance, even if they say they do. When it comes down to it, unless the client is really technical, in which case they probably wouldn't be coming to you any, anyway, they don't want to deal with hosting. The second is customer support and website changes. So clients don't really realize that they need this until they need this. It's kind of like insurance. You don't need it until you need it. But I'm sure all of you have experienced a client that you charged a one-off for, and then they come back a couple months later and say, hey, I want to just make an update to my site. Can you do this? And if you're nice, you say yes. If you're strict, you say yes, but it'll cost you a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and if you're busy, you say no. And so if you impress upon that client, look, you, a couple months down the road, you're going to come to me and you're going to need something. You want to have a number to call. You want to have an email address that you can send an email to and say, hey, I just need this quick change. You don't want to have to go to a freelancer. You don't want to have to find someone else. You don't want to worry if I'm available. For a nominal fee, I'll be there. I'll get the change done the next day. So that's a pretty big selling point if you can frame it the correct way. Another thing that you can charge for is reporting and analytics. Um, if you have you know, uh, some SEO tools, you can generate those automatically each month, and then you're essentially just charging for those. Uh, that's also a nice value add, and it can show what you're doing for your client or how much business uh, the website is generating for your client. If you have a multi-site, like if you have all of your clients on a single multi-site, you might be able to charge for ongoing platform improvements. So it could be you know, a new caching plugin. It could be um, new reporting tools. It could be new SEO tools. And finally, the obvious, you can charge recurring for marketing services, SEO, social media management, et cetera. And finally, uh, we did have some lessons learned in the actual acquisition process. So one thing is, again, niche was a big factor. That made us a much more attractive acquisition target because there were uh, alignments with a bunch of other larger companies in the industry. So we could partner up with um, practice management software companies in the legal space, and we would exchange leads back and forth with a bunch of different companies. And so we were constantly in communication with these companies, and they, you know, none of them really offered web design services. So if they wanted to expand their business or hedge a certain part of their business, they could come to us and, you know, we might be an attractive target, and we were an attractive target for uh, a business in our industry. Another thing, again, recurring revenue. We had a book of business. We had, you know, X amount of recurring revenue. So when the uh, company came to us and we talked about the acquisition, they knew uh, that they could depend upon a certain amount of recurring revenue each month. So it was they were buying more of an asset in that sense rather than just a, you know, a, a marketing plan that was generating leads. This one is a tax consideration. So use a separate business entity. So if you have a WordPress plugin business and you have a WordPress design business, the chances are you're not going to get a company to come in and want to acquire both of those. They're going to want to acquire one or the other. If you have them combined into one entity, you're forced to do 
what's called an asset purchase, which has a less favorable tax treatment than if you have that broken up into two separate entities. So if you have two LLCs, you can sell off an entire LLC and then you get a cap gains treatment. If you do an asset purchase, it becomes trickier. You can get cap gains treatment, but you have to do some accounting tricks in order to make it happen. So separate your businesses if you think that one is going to be an attractive target. Keep good books. Uh, due diligence took about a month, and they asked for everything. So we gave them access to all, all our Stripe account, our Zero account. They went through everything. And if we hadn't had our, our books in order, I'm not sure that the deal would have gone through because they were very concerned with making sure that they could see our numbers and, and verify that what we were telling them was actually what was going on within our business. So keep good books. I know it's a pain in the butt to, you know, open your zero account or open QuickBooks or take pictures of receipts, but it's very important. And the last one is kind of a wild card, be an authority. So we had a pretty well-trafficked blog, or we still have a well-trafficked blog, and we had built up some brand recognition in the industry, and that was a, a, another big part of why they liked us is because they could acquire that brand and have that improve their own brand equity. And if anyone actually liked this presentation, uh, I have a course, uh, the coupon code for, uh, it's a free, free course if you use the coupon code, uh, BWP2017, um, and you can get more information. I kind of expand on some points there. Again, it's, it's free with that coupon code. And feel free to email me if you have questions or else I'll be out and about if you want to come talk to me. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, two questions. When you were uh, selling your uh, product and services to the legal groups, like were you dealing with owners or sort of like an IT department within those groups? I mean, what, was that, what did that look like? And the second question is how many, before you were able to sell, Uh, okay, did everyone hear the question or should I repeat? Everyone good? Um, so, um, we had two businesses under the umbrella and we dealt with the founder of the company. It was, it was a larger company than ours, but not like a giant company. I think if it was um, a giant company, well, I mean, in, in our space, I, I can't think of too many businesses that would have bought us out where we wouldn't be dealing with a founder. I mean, there are a couple, but um, I'd say if your acquirer is 100 or less, you'll probably be dealing with um, the CEO or at least like VP of BizDev. Does that answer your question? Uh, I'm not sure. I meant, meant to ask when you were building the niche, building the products, or how many actual attorney groups did you have on Oh, how many clients? Yeah. Uh, over 100 by the time we sold. Yeah. Yep. So what was the most difficult part about building your business? Was it like getting new clients or was it the accounting part? Or I'm sure there was lots of issues. Yeah, good question. The most difficult part. Uh, I, I think getting new clients is always the most difficult part, right? That's, you know, it's probably the most asked question is how you get new clients. But, um, again, Choosing a niche, I think, helps. Even though you're turning business away in the beginning, you're able to target people a lot more specifically, which opens up the ability to do content marketing. You're not, you don't have to rely on in-person marketing as much. Uh, your sales cycles are shorter because there's more trust built in and people have been you know, hanging around your blog for a while, so they already feel like they know you a little bit. Um, and... You know, what we found is that content marketing will take you a lot of the way, and then you have to start diversifying your strategy into PPC, paid advertising, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, content marketing will get you a lot of the way. And also, if you're in these niches, 
there aren't that many companies that are really doing content marketing well. Like in the legal space, we when we first started content marketing, there really weren't that many people who were really focusing on it. And that's kind of true in a bunch of these niches, restaurants, whatever, um, that you can start ranking for some keywords that people are looking for. Like we have, we had an article that just compared practice management software that was driving thousands of visits a month and you know hundreds of email signups a month, and that was just one article. But it was pretty easy to get that ranked, um, and so again, content marketing was kind of how we solved that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so we, so I freelanced for three years and then w once we made the switch, uh, it was three years with, uh, building the company before we were acquired. Um, we had five employee, uh, four employees. We were about to hire another one when we sold. Uh, now it's just six. I mean, not, not a huge company, but you know, we could, because of all of these efficiencies, we could serve a lot of clients with a very small team. Um, is that, is it, was there one more part? Did you all move to the new company, uh, or what are you up to now? No, so we kept our office in New York. They wanted to have a, they're a company out of Minnesota, and they wanted to have a presence in New York anyway because there are a ton of law firms in New York. Um, as part of the deal, so I had a co-founder. My co-founder is staying on for a few years. I stayed on half half, half time for a year. Um, that's pretty much coming to an end now. And so now I'm working on uh, my new company, Offsprout, which is, what? Uh, which is a, a web design platform for agencies. So it's basically applying. It allows you to apply the concepts of productizing a web design agency more easily. Um, yeah, so I, I started freelancing right out of college and I, you know, like I said, it was, it was a struggle. Um, I was poor for a while. <laughs> um, and you know, at, at a certain point I was like, all right, I, I have to change something. I got to try something else. And so I was doing reading at the time and, um, I think it was actually a little bit into this business. I read about productizing, and that, that's kind of when everything clicked. Like, this is, this is how I could kind of organize my thoughts about this. Um, and so from that point, it was just like, okay, we're building a productized uh, design agency for, for attorneys. Uh, there's a second part of your question? No, okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so it was two designers, two salespeople, and then we were going to hire like a, a marketing uh, consultant to, to do the marketing for clients. And that person was hired shortly after, and now added another salesperson. Yep. Which book or which resource do you read for <laughs> uh, So Brian Castle is pretty big. Uh, in, in the productized community to the extent that it exists. Um, and he's, he's the thought leader that I look to at that, at that point. And I still I have a lot of respect for uh, his thought leadership in the space. So C-A-S-E-L is how you spell his last name. On your speech. Wondering, I guess, in a world of WordPress and Squarespace and Wix, like, how do you keep that sense at the higher price point that you're really doing something custom? Um, well, it sounds like what you're basically saying is make everything a template that can be a template. 
Yeah, so we we are customizing off a template, um, but you know we often get people. We we often get attorney clients who have come from Squarespace or Wix or Weebly, and they said, you know what, we thought we could do this, but it, even even platforms like that, it requires skill, um, and so you know. There are, you're going to get some leads that come in and say, oh, $3,000, I don't know about that. I'm going to try it in Squarespace. And you say, you know what, I, I wish you good luck. Um, but it, those tools haven't evolved to the point yet, and I'm not sure if they ever will, where they really fulfill the need for someone that's not technical. <coughs> and so if you can kind of clearly and gently say that to your potential client, um, then you can kind of show the value that you're providing. And again, even though clients want to think that they're unique snowflakes and you can, you can customize a template to, to meet their needs, they're not a snowflake, they're a pizza, right? You're just putting toppings on the pizza and you say, oh, you know, I, I know you love pepperoni, so I'm adding a little extra pepperoni to your meat lover's pizza just for you. So... Anybody else? All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.